Hey everybody, Mike here with another edition of Making Sense of Transformers, a series where I talk about various topics within the Transformers movie universe. Actually, scratch that. The Transformers movie multiverse. That need a little extra analysis and explanation. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to comment, hit that like button, and subscribe. And don't forget to click that bell to be notified of future uploads. You can also follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok to show some extra support and access exclusive content. Now this is going to be a really fun episode, as it's going to be completely different than my normal Making Sense of Transformers topics. We're going to be looking at something that didn't happen in the Bayverse. We're going to be looking at a mostly unknown, yet official, alternate reality story where the Decepticons won the Battle of Mission City. So what happens in this branch of the multiverse, and does the continuity hold up to new information presented in the main universe sequels? Let's find out. So while Marvel might be well known for their What If comics and successful Disney Plus series, the Transformers live action movie universe had its own version of What If, a 17 part comic series that began in March 2008 and ran all the way up to the release of Transformers Revenge of the Fallen in June 2009. In fact, alternate universes seem to be a bit of a theme for Transformers in 2008 as IDW also started publishing the Shattered Glass comic series that year, which focused on a mirror dimension where Optimus and the Autobots are evil and Megatron and the Decepticons are good and heroic. Now the live-action comic series is actually really entertaining, with the only real downside being a very inconsistent art style. Each new issue looks different than the one that came before because new artists were used for each one and there are even some instances where the character designs change within the same issue. Notably, RC starts out with a design based on her concept art when she was set to appear in the first film, but by the end of the issue she has a completely G1 styled appearance. Other issues include Transformers switching color schemes, and even the President of the United States being drawn with different hair, builds, and ages, so it can get pretty confusing for a casual reader. But as I said, that's really the only major complaint I have, as the series is mainly full of fairly good writing and interesting story ideas. One of which is even used years later in the third film, Dark of the Moon. More on that later. Now when I first heard about this series, I thought it'd be a really cool thing to cover for a video. But I ran into a major problem. It's absolutely nowhere to be found. Definitely not here. Ugh, keep searching. I need you to be quiet for five minutes. The comics were printed as part of a monthly subscription magazine called Transformers, from Titan Magazines. Very creative, I know. The magazine was exclusive to the United Kingdom and ran from 2007 through 2014. Titan first gained the rights to a Transformers comic series in 2005, but with the first live-action movie set to release in two years, they decided to sit on it for a while until they could capitalize on a projected surge in popularity. Unfortunately, since the comics were part of a monthly magazine, that means there is no way to access them if you don't actually own the original physical copies. There are no digital copies of the comics, and there is no way to buy them anywhere unless you happen to get lucky on eBay. But you'd probably have more luck finding old glasses and printed with a map to the AllSpark. How'd you know about his glasses? eBay. eBay. Sadly, this makes them lost media, a term to describe pieces of media that are non-existent, missing, or unavailable to the general public. Now, while I could have looked at some wiki summaries and called it a day, I was really determined to somehow track down and find these comics. And after a week of on and off searching, I accomplished my mission. Lord Megatron, I have found something of great interest. Scans of the original comics are sitting comfortably available for download in an unofficial Transformers out of print media archive. I don't know who uploaded them in 2021, but if you happen to be watching, I appreciate you. 
So each issue of this series featured comics that tied into Michael Bay's movie universe, and all of them were written by Simon Furman. Furman quickly realized that it was going to be difficult trying to not contradict the movies and its sequels, so by the ninth issue of the magazine, he started a new series called Twilight's Last Gleaming, a multiverse story that follows the events of what would happen if the Autobots lost the battle, all of the Decepticons survived, and Sam Witwicky died. What's interesting when looking at the events of this alternate reality is how closely it follows, or how far it strays from, world-building elements that were established over the next 15 years in future sequels. While I do think it jumps the shark a bit in some of the later issues, Furman actually does a very good job adhering to plot elements that hadn't even been thought of yet by the film's writers. The first issue of this series kicks off with a monologue from Michaela Baines as she reflects on what could have been. What if the good guys won? In her universe, Sam's attempt at killing Megatron failed, and the Decepticon leader Spark successfully merged with the AllSpark. It quickly jumps right into the action as Michaela and Bumblebee are driving through a war-torn city, notably with Bumblebee still having his voice, but he suddenly regained at the end of the 2007 film. Your voice? I have not heard it since Cybertron fell. Yeah, no Optimus. You heard it in 2007. Everyone just conveniently forgot about it. Sorry, my bad. Oh, I got Our planet is overrun with Decepticons, and only a few surviving Autobots seem to remain on Earth. Ratchet, Ironhide, and B. Jazz still met the same exact fate as what happened in the movie, being torn in half by Megatron. Megatron, meanwhile, is sitting comfortably aboard a Decepticon ship as he plans on using the power of the AllSpark to cyberform Earth and kill all human life. Dropkick randomly seems to be Megatron's right-hand man, and while he doesn't really resemble the version of the character we see in Bumblebee, we can probably go ahead and consider them to be one and the same. This is the multiverse, after all. But anyway, since Sam was killed during the Battle of Mission City, Michaela became good friends with Bumblebee and turned into a key player in the resistance against the Decepticons. They were paired together for a very important mission under the direction of Tom Banachek, free Optimus Prime from the same frozen prison that was used for Megatron inside Hoover Dam. Phase 2 of their plan involves a bunch of Autobot reinforcements hiding on the moon, waiting for the right time to strike, which is actually pretty similar to the plan the Decepticons had in Dark of the Moon. They waited to get transported to Earth after awaking Sentinel Prime, while the Autobots were holding their position until Optimus could be awakened. Unfortunately for them, Starscream, Scorponok, and Dreadwing spoil the party, and they have to retreat to Earth earlier than planned. While that's happening, Bumblebee and Michaela play a bit of hide-and-seek with Megatron at the Sector 7 base. Even Frenzy decides to show up, which I assume means the little Decepticon was ultimately able to kill Glenn, Maggie, Simmons, and Keller, as none of them show up at any point during this series. Part 4 of the series is extremely action-packed as all of the different storylines start to merge. Michaela fights Frenzy while trying to shut down the freezing system, while Bumblebee does his best to distract Megatron, and the Autobots from the moon crash land on Earth, and Ratchet and Ironhide battle Bonecrusher while trying to stop the cyberforming process. Ultimately, Michaela is able to figure out what to do with guidance from Banachek, and Optimus Prime is freed from stasis. But that's not all she does. She also hands Bumblebee the key to defeating Megatron. Apparently, Sector 7 created a self-invigorating nanovirus designed to block all of the AllSpark's operational frequencies as a last resort if they ever lost control of it. Bumblebee used this technology to quickly dispose of Megatron, who was basically extremely roided up on AllSpark energy. Ironhide, Ratchet, and the other Autobots also successfully complete their part of the mission, blowing up the AllSpark Power Distribution Hub, as it's called preventing the cyberforming process from destroying Earth. So everything wraps up rather nicely. Megatron was killed, the Earth was saved, and Michaela was a hero and helped avenge Sam's death. But, there was one loose end remaining. 
star screen. The original run of this series was supposed to come to an end after the five-issue Twilight's Last Gleaming series, but Furman ended up continuing it long past that, with the first sequel material being a two-parter called Aftermath. The first issue picks up right where we left off, with Optimus Prime lamenting the destruction of the Allspark, meaning it could not be used to create worlds and fill them with life. If only he knew about- Transformium. That's what we're calling it. Focus grouped. Catchy. However, before you know it, the Autobots do find a shard that they immediately lock up for safekeeping. Meanwhile, Earth is not in a great place, even after stopping the cyberforming process and defeating Megatron. While you might think things would start going back to normal, there's a lot of stuff that starts happening all at once. First off, there is a lot of unrest across the world regarding the Autobots staying on the planet. Secondly, while the cyberforming process was stopped, it seems like it affected the Earth enough to the point where people were randomly getting sick. Thirdly, Starscream and surviving Decepticons attack a shelter to turn the public against the Autobots even further. And finally, we find out that Starscream has used tiny Insecticons to implant devices into certain powerful human leaders, including the newest US President, Theodore Allen, for mind control purposes. So yeah, there is a lot happening. After two issues of Aftermath, the series transitions into Dark Spark. Nope, not the video game. And this only lasts for one issue and mainly focuses on Jazz. Even though he was torn in half, Ratchet was able to harness the power of the Allspark Shard they found to revive him. While the operation is successful, Optimus Prime is left fairly concerned about how Jazz will react to it, since it was corrupted by Megatron. Jazz seems completely fine at first, just maybe a little bit more reckless, but it's not long before the revived Autobot turns on Ratchet. Oddly enough, his first plan of action is to auction off an Energon deposit using a Hollow Forum Activator a piece of technology that seems to communicate with other aliens throughout the universe. However, before Jazz is really able to do anything, the Decepticons attack and he runs off. Or drives off, I should say, leaving Ratchet to question what he's done by unleashing a corrupted Autobot. Things start to get a little weird with the Return to Cybertron series that has a run of four issues. Optimus Prime informs the President that unfortunately they were a little too late in stopping the cyberforming process, and now the organic and technological portions of the planet are basically struggling for a new status quo. The good news is that Prime has a plan, sending a team of Autobots to Cybertron to retrieve Nucleon, a substance that could save the world from tearing itself apart. Prime is warned by the Autobot camshaft, Oh, I love it when you say camshafts. Whisper to me. Camshafts. That the Nucleon could have horrible side effects as well, but Prime sees no other option at this point. Once the Autobots arrive on their home planet, they quickly come across a group of rogue Decepticons led by one named Stockade. Stockade has his own plan set in motion as he and his Decepticons have summoned an entity to Cybertron using none other than Nucleon, of course, in hopes of it restoring their world. Unfortunately for them, this entity ends up being Unicron. Now, of course, in Transformers The Last Night, we discover that Unicron is basically Earth's core, and considering the movies hadn't even remotely considered the possibility of using Unicron in live action yet, author Simon Furman took a lot of creative liberty with this idea. Earth has another name. Unicron. Earth. Unicron. Cybertron's ancient enemy. While this is supposed to be an alternate universe, this is the first point in the series that it takes a considerable turn from the Bayverse canon, even though it wasn't canon for another nine years. For the sake of following the story from here on out, we just have to accept that Unicron is not inside Earth in this universe. He actually ends up being inside Cybertron. 
Now, while most of this part of the story takes place on Cybertron, we do get some brief glimpses of what's happening on Earth, and probably the biggest event is that the President implants a Decepticon control chip into Michaela's neck. And, of course, Optimus Prime ends up needing to leave her in charge of the Autobot base, while they jet off to Cybertron to assist Bumblebee, Ironhide, and RC. And as soon as they leave, Michaela lets Starscream right in through the front door. Now leading into the final part of Return to Cybertron, using a special transportation ability, Unicron has transported himself to our solar system with Cybertron as his vessel. So with both the Autobots and Rogue Decepticons having the same enemy, they decide to work together to stop him by removing the Nucleon. And as a side note, a pretty interesting detail from this issue is that once the Transformers start to travel inside Cybertron, Unicron sends out these bat-like creatures to attack them, which is very similar to what Unicron does in the Transformers Prime TV series. In the show, Optimus calls them a type of antibody, which is a protein used by the immune system to identify and neutralize foreign objects such as pathogenic bacteria and viruses. So anyway, after completing some internal sabotage, the Transformers trick Unicron into draining more Nucleon, which pretty much causes a giant explosion and kills him, leaving Cybertron floating right outside Earth's atmosphere, just like in Dark of the Moon and The Last Night. Now, with our space travel saga complete, the Autobots return to Earth with the Nucleon needed to hopefully restore the planet. But since the Decepticons now control the Autobot base, they made sure not to roll out the welcome mat. The Autobots are forced to retreat, leaving Michaela behind, who is pretty creepily being taunted by Starscream. He says to her, I wonder, is there still some small part of you that remembers and yearns for rescue? Inside, behind the blank eyes, are you screaming, come back? So, with Nucleon now being on Earth and the Earth practically being saved from being cyberformed even further, the Autobots end up setting shop at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland, and a military general relays a message to Optimus that the President wants to meet. Prime goes alone and discovers that it's actually a trap orchestrated by Jazz. The corrupted Allspark must have increased his ego a bit as he plans to kill Optimus all by himself. Before Prime and Jazz can fight, however, a Decepticon named Colt the Executioner interrupts them. Jazz feels entitled to fighting Optimus, so he kills Colt, leading Prime to thank him for saving his life and letting him know that his true Autobot self is still buried deep inside. Jazz disagrees with this and tells Optimus that he'll prove him wrong when they meet again, but unfortunately this is the last time we see Jazz in this alternate universe, leaving his fate up in the air as an unresolved cliffhanger. Throughout the series, you'll notice that Jazz acts as some type of mercenary that's out for money, and even calls Prime his contract. By the end of this issue, Optimus is able to put two and two together, realizing that the one who placed the bounty on his head was none other than the brainwashed President of the United States. The Decepticon who haunted himself ties up a loose end with Michaela, but it mainly serves as a prologue to the final three issues of this alternate universe story. And these final issues actually have some striking similarities to Dark of the Moon and Age of Extinction years before the movies were made. With Michaela still held captive, the Autobots launch a massive rescue mission to get her back, and thanks to using some type of advanced jammer, they deactivate her chip and rescue her. But as they depart, the focus turns to Starscream, who realizes that somehow the Allspark transferred Megatron's consciousness inside him. So pretty similar to how Megatron infected the KSI drone named Galvatron in Age of Extinction. The main difference here being that Starscream quite literally has Megatron in his head. And now we finally arrive at the 15th, 16th, and 17th issues of the Transformers What If story. And these three issues are basically the events of Dark of the Moon, with Starscream taking over Sentinel Prime's role. 
I have to wonder if writer Aaron Kruger used this story as some inspiration, or if it was a total coincidence. I assume it was a coincidence, but it's pretty crazy that this portion of the alternate universe story was written only months before Kruger started on the screenplay for the third film. Our finale begins with various Decepticons, including Barricade and Brawl, delivering a message from Starscream. If the humans force the Autobots to leave Earth, there will be peace, and they will be content with staying within the confines of the territory they have already claimed, becoming an independent, sovereign state within the borders of the United States. The government quickly agrees to this demand and orders the Autobots to leave the planet. And the parallels to Dark the Moon are truly astonishing here, as Michaela has a discussion outside the ship with Optimus Prime, but is extremely similar to the conversation between Optimus and Sam. During the departure scene in the movie, Sam says, I need to know how you're going to fight back. I know this is a strategy, I know you're coming back with reinforcements, I know there's a plan. To which Optimus says, there is no plan. Your leaders have spoken. From here, the fight will be your own. In the comic, Michaela pleads that there must be something they can do, but Prime tells her that the Autobots have overstayed their welcome. They then board a ship that resembles a G1-styled Ark, but for continuity's sake, I'm just gonna go ahead and call it the Xanthium, which is the ship the Autobots used to depart Earth in the movie. Now in Dark of the Moon, Sam and the other humans watch as Starscream shoots down the Xanthium right after takeoff, supposedly killing every Autobot on board. The comic has this play out a little differently, as instead of getting his hands dirty, Starscream instead orders one of his mind-controlled human leaders to launch a nuclear warhead at the ship. Instead of Sam looking into the distance to see the Autobot ship destroyed, in this universe, it's Michaela and the Decepticons begin another all-out assault. However, just like in Dark of the Moon, the Autobots saw this Decepticon plan coming. So it's revealed that there were actually two ships. The one shot down was a decoy, while the Autobots took off for Cybertron in a cloaked ship. When they make it to Cybertron, they make a deal with Stockade and his rogue group to assist them in a final battle against the Decepticons on Earth. While Stockade agreed to this deal, he has his own plans to turn on the Autobots. Now while all this is happening, Megatron had convinced Starscream to use the AllSpark Shard and the AllSpark Interface Module inside Hoover Dam to transfer his consciousness back into his body. Immediately after he's restored, Megatron heads straight to a giant battle between his Earthbound Decepticons and Stockade's forces which is exactly what the Autobots wanted. While they were on Cybertron to make a deal with Stockade, they began researching Unicron's teleportation ability, which they were able to use to create a system that would transport any tag transformer back to their home planet. Once the bots arrive on the scene, they tag all the Decepticons, both Megatron's and Stockade's forces alike, and beam them away before teleporting Cybertron itself out of Earth's solar system. And what's kinda nice is that Simon Furman made sure to cover his tracks from a potential plot hole by having Ironhide explain that the teleportation technology on Cybertron was rigged to blow immediately after the planet blipped away, meaning there would hopefully be no way for the Decepticons to ever return to Earth. So there you have it, the full story of the Lost Media comic detailing an interesting alternate universe where the Autobots lost the Battle of Mission City. While the introduction of Unicron doesn't quite align with the Bayverse continuity, even for alternate universe standards, everything else adheres fairly well to canon that was not established until years later, including some really neat parallels to Dark of the Moon and Age of Extinction. To check out my previous episodes of this series, head over to the Making Sense of Transformers playlist on my channel and make sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more Transformers related content. Signing out, I'm Mike. See you next time.